GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your trusted source for useful and legitimate Web3 information so you don't fall behind the internet revolution. I'm Jay Bird, and I believe that Web3 is going to change the world. That's why we're here to guide the world's top talent down the rabbit hole as you participate, contribute, and capitalize on the opportunity. Today, I'm super excited to have on the show Max Howell, the CEO of T.XYZ with us to break down open source and how the internet was initially built. And what that has led us to is this problem where 95% of software used on the internet, whether it be by major companies like Google or by just a small project, a small business, 95% software is using open source code. Now that's great because that means that we have created this internet that grew exponentially because we developed so much open source, but it creates this problem because we are not acknowledging and compensating the creators. There's nothing going towards those creators. And that is clearly a problem I think we would all agree on. And Max, is creating a solution to that with his new company, T.XYZ. Now, Max is formerly the creator of Homebrew. If you're a developer or a programmer, you will know all about Homebrew or Brew, which is one of the largest open source projects of all time with tens of millions of users to this day. Max also worked at Apple where he was a senior developer. He himself has built a lot of open source code, which the internet is built on. His code has been used by Google, his code has been used by Square, and for his accomplishments, for his contributions to the internet, Google sent him a blanket and I and Square sent him an iPad. So he knew that he needed to figure out a way to get compensation flowing to these developers that are building this essential infrastructure layer of the internet, which is what hit, made him want to found T.XYZ. So you're gonna love this conversation. We also, in the end, talk a lot about AI and Max's views around AI, which are fascinating. So make sure you stick around all the way to the end. It's a great show for you today. Before we jump in though, let's just take a minute to hear from our sponsors who make this show possible. The future of social media is here, and that future lives in Web3 on top of Lens Protocol. Web2 social platforms are broken and ripe for disruption. You see, the epicenter of social media is the creators, and yet they are the most neglected. Web2 platforms like Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram are all essentially robbing creators of their worth. Creators are a new type of entrepreneur, forming new types of businesses. Yet with Web2 platforms, creators don't own their content or their profiles, and that's their product and business. Instead, they are tied to the platforms they choose to create on. Well, just like how crypto is freeing us from banks, Web3 is freeing us from these centralized platforms. On Lens Protocol, creators own their content, own their profile, and even their social graph and followers in the form of NFTs. This allows you to move freely from one social application to another with your content, profile, and followers moving along with you. Lens Protocol enables self-sovereignty for your social graph and interoperability across the internet. At Web3 Academy, we believe this is the future of social, and that's why we partner with Lens to ensure that the path of social media is heading in the right direction. Visit lens.xyz to learn more today. What if I told you that industry pioneers from flagship Web3 brands such as Consensus, Polygon, Binance, Unstoppable Domains, Ledger, and Uniswap will all meet up in one place this summer. You don't want to miss this. I'm talking about the epic Web3 conference taking place in beautiful Lisbon on the 9th of June with over 20 curated talks, speed consultations with Web3 experts, networking sessions with investors, and even the opportunity to raise funds. This conference has it all and you'll get the tools you need to succeed in this industry. Plus, we at Web3 Academy will attend and host a community meetup with you and the other smart community before the main event. So come along, meet us, network, and start building alongside leading Web3 innovators. We can't wait to meet you. Remember, Lisbon, Portugal, 9th of June. We've got a 15% discount for you, but ticket prices go up every few days. So get your tickets today by using the link in the show notes. Enter the promo code WEB3ACADEMY15 to secure your spot. Or if you become a pro member, you can get an even bigger discount. So go pro today. 
and we'll see you in Lisbon, Portugal, on the 9th of June at the Epic Web3 Conference. Max, welcome to the show. So excited to have you today. Thanks for having me here. I've been really looking forward to this episode because you come from a different world than I do. A different world than many of our listeners. You know, Your background is deep in the development of the internet. You're a builder through which we are very grateful for all of that. So thank you. And it's always interesting to get the developer's point of view because you guys see things first before the rest of us. You know, you're at the beginning starting block first to build the foundational layer of the internet and slowly, you know, over the last few years, you've taken a big leap into Web3 and so excited to learn all about that. But let's start back at the beginning of your Web3 journey. How did you first fall down the rabbit hole and what caught your attention? What got you into the space? I had a friend, uh, Timothy Lewis, who I met in Chicago in like 2014, maybe. He fell down the rabbit hole much earlier than myself. And he's been trying to get me into it for years. I remember him calling me up and saying, hey, Max, there's this new thing, Ethereum. Like, you can do solidity <laughs> contracts for 500 bucks an hour. And, uh, <laughs> and he was really eager to get me into it. But I never found it like that interesting, i got to be honest. Like, I got into Web 2 when it was new. And then I rode that wave up and it was really exciting and fun. And it felt like everyone was saying it's stupid until they stopped saying it because it was everywhere. But then um, Timothy uh, like called me up again. He was starting this DAO and he wanted me to participate. So I started diving in there, like got involved in his DAO. And then I uh, looked at all everything else that was going on in the sector. Like I remember it was a couple of months where I was just voraciously like uh, consuming information on the everything that had happened that I hadn't been paying attention to. And uh, it was during all of that that I had the idea for what is now my uh, venture funded company, T. As a builder and a developer, you've seen and you've been part of, as you said, you know, Web2, you've been part of the creation of the internet and you've seen how important open source is to building the internet. And I guess, I'm guessing that maybe this is what led you to get jaded and what led you to not want to participate and maybe to leave and to try other passions. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you, you can correct me. What happened that led you to get jaded? And what was it about Web3 that made you say, oh yeah, this is why I wanted to do this in the beginning? You're right. I hadn't really thought about it, but it's just true. Like I got into tech through open source because i did a chemistry degree i thought i wanted to be a scientist well i got into programming via open source i saw linux on my computer after i like, deciding that i was fed up with chemistry and uh, i discovered the open source communities that were there i discovered all these really neat little communities of people who were working on things not because they wanted to get rich but because they cared about what they were building we're trying mm -hmm. to change the world in some way or like, maybe not in a big way, maybe in a small way, but sometimes in big ways. And sometimes you didn't know how much of a difference you were going to really make. All these communities and these people are building open source code and have been for a while. How does open source code for a non-developer, how is this shared? How do other people use it? And maybe this actually leads in nicely to the way a lot of your code has been used in the creation of the internet. It's been used by Google, it's been used by Square. And when they use open source code, do you get compensated? Do you get acknowledged for that? Are they just stealing it or taking it? The history of open source is somewhat interesting. Like initially, right, it started with the creation of Unix and probably other things around that, which weren't as famous. Uh, that was just a bunch of people in a university somewhere who wanted to build the tools they needed to get their other jobs done until the job that they liked best was what they were writing. And then that became their job. And this is like how it usually works for open source devs. It's like the thing they build becomes way more interesting than whatever they were trying to do with it. <laughs> There's always a reason they're building the thing. Well, it was the same with me and Brew. I was building Brew because the job I had, we needed something like Brew. And I kept mm. complaining about how the fact that this thing we needed like Brew didn't exist until one of my coworkers challenged me to build it. So I did. And uh, it turned out to be huge in the end nowadays people say 95 percent of all software is open source and it's probably true so like you know over the last 10 15 years i'd say open source became like a behemoth and those of us who were building at the time when it's it made the shift found that our stuff was being used everywhere companies made massive amounts of money out of the open source software that exists 
This was a gradual process. So there was no like real thinking at the time about right. should these people be paid? Like right. we did it for free, right? We did it out of the goodness of our own hearts. But the truth is that I put tens of thousands of hours into homebrew and it did become something that I didn't feel I could give up because I felt I owed everyone who was using it something. Just for our listeners, can you explain homebrew quickly so everyone understands homebrew? Because you have mentioned it a few times and I want to make sure everyone yeah. understands. Well, homebrew uh, was uh, just a piece of software I started writing in 2009. Well, it's just a package manager, right? I always say it's just a package manager. But the thing about package managers is that every software developer needs one. If they don't use a package manager, then they're narcissists. <laughs> okay. And so for us non devs, what's a package manager? So it basically just installs and updates and uninstalls and manages the configuration and like allows you to do a few more things on top of the packages and packages are projects. They're just bits of open source software. It's not sexy what it does, but it's essential. It turned out with homebrew, I wrote one that just fixed enough of the issues all the other ones had and had enough like neat little features and ideas and things in it that it took the community by storm and uh, it became very popular very quickly. And nowadays, yeah, it's extremely well used. There isn't many people who dev that don't use it. Yeah, embarrassingly successful, honestly. <laughs> that's, you shouldn't be embarrassed. Good for you. It's great. You deserve all the credit for building something that's so useful. Okay, so you left homebrew, you took some time off, you got jaded, you did you were, you know, <laughs> yeah. tried out another career in teaching. We won't go down any other on that path of how that was, but I'm sure that was his own adventure. And then you got pulled back into Web3 and you decided okay, there's a better solution to funding open source projects and to rewarding, or rewarding is actually the wrong word, to acknowledging and compensating these devs that are burning out and are putting their life's work into this essential infrastructure. And that, putting words in your mouth, that led to the creation of T.XYZ. You can jump in here and tell your side, your version of the story. Yeah, I stopped working on Homebrew a lot probably like 2014, 2015 or so. And I passed it over to the community that had emerged. The current lead maintainer is, he was a friend and he got involved with the project. And then he was more interested in like the maintenance side of it than me. So I just sort of, you know, I've always liked making new things. So this is really the truth of it. So, you know, I never thought I'd make another one, another brew. People would ask me, are you going to make another brew? Because like, they had issues with it and like, I agreed for their <laughs> issues and... You know, mature stuff, software tends to stagnate. No offense to the people who, you know, a lot of people who really work hard on brew nowadays and for free mostly still. You know, homebrew has sponsorship. They have like a couple of hundred grand in the bank. That doesn't stay in one salary. No. Like no. one person, maybe. maybe yeah, one maybe. <laughs> There's loads of people. Package managers need a lot of people because there's a hundred million open source projects, right? Including all the versions. So that's a lot of things to like, package together and make function and a lot of different expertise uh, so yeah i never thought i'd make another one but then when i got into web3 i had this lightning bolt moment late at night after i'd smoked some weed and uh, i saw the the potential because the package manager understands the entire open source stack all the dependencies all the connections which packages are the most important which mm -hmm. ones need the most maintenance costs Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, I could see how I could build a package manager on top of Web3 tech and then effectively try to remunerate open source in a fair and useful manner. Not like just throwing money at the whole thing, but throwing it at the places where it counts. Mm -hmm. Also, flowing that token through it correctly. Most projects that are sponsored sit at what I call the top of the stack. They're the favorites the things that people know about. But open source is like this tower of blocks, bricks, should we say. Blocks is not a good word for blockchain related <laughs> topics. Like bricks like uh, that have been built on top of each other. So in the last 35 years, open source has gradually become like so enormous. All these blocks, bricks stacked on top of each other. And like the stuff that's lower down, nobody knows about. I understand that you're going, what you're doing, as you said, this flow down approach where each Lego piece or each brick that's being used is getting its fair share. Where is that share coming from? Is that coming from T or is that coming from 
sponsorship on T's level or donations? And then how are you deciding who it goes out to and how it goes out to them? How is that distributed? It's going to be a, a sale of token at some point. Anyway, we're going to give out a bunch to open source devs. So people will choose to stake against packages. And um, well, I'm hoping it's also going to be larger companies at some point. Anyway, like the uh, open source community will, the community in general, will put pressure on these companies that are making so much money using their open source to put their money where their mouth is. Because now we've created a actual automation layer for correctly distributing monies to the projects that you depend on. And if you use T, it'll tell you like which projects you're using. So you just feed mm. that into the smart contract that you're using and like it will stake against the top packages. And then every stake epoch will give out some rewards, some to you for staking and some to the packages that you're staking against. Probably a more significant percentage towards the ones you're staking against. So, you know, in a way it's still like a donation model, but what we're building is effectively an economy built on code. And we want the token value to represent like the value of open source and for people to start building DeFi products on top of that. We actually have a number of really interesting ideas that we're going to float with the community later when, when we're live so that they can start building out those things. But it should be uh, a good utility case, essentially, where people are building DeFi products on top of these intrinsically valuable properties. Open source is tremendously valuable. It's just that we haven't found a way to actually directly correlate that in the part mm -hmm. with T. We're hoping that that's what's going to happen. T sounds more like a public good to me. How does T make money? What's T's business model? So, you know, the protocol is going to be spun up as a DAO or a Swiss association associated with it. So the, you know, team like will hand that over and not be participating. I'm not going to take percentage of like the token rewards or anything like shady like that. Obviously, T Incorporated is going to keep a bunch of the tokens, so that will help us like keep funded for a while. But I have a bunch of like revenue models using the token to a certain extent. But yeah, no, it should I go into it? I don't think I've talked about it publicly before. But we're releasing like this graphical complement to. So uh, we've already released the package manager. Released it in November. Got 6,000 stars, trended a few times, lots of passionate users coming along. Tens of thousands of people actually using it already. So that's a terminal tool, it's in the terminal. So uh, developers love the terminal. Not all developers love the terminal. That's certainly become more and more true as the software industry has like doubled and quadrupled and 10x, 100x in size mm -hmm. over the last 10, 15 years. But it's a very useful tool, but yeah, it's not for everyone. So the idea of making a graphical complement is always in my mind. Also, I used to receive emails from people who weren't developers who used Homebrew because there's some things in the open source ecosystem that there isn't an equivalent for. There's no like crappy Web2 portal that does some of these things, or it's difficult to make a spreadsheet or a data, like something like Microsoft Access database type thing to do it. Mm -hmm. So they needed these things, and these were architects and scientists and things. So the idea of making a graphical complement was always there. But over time, we've realized that it's effectively like a kind of app store for developers. And so we want to build like um, store-like functionality on top of that. And we will take a percentage from uh, sales and services on that. Mm -hmm. Explain to me more when you say it's like an app store for developers. It's the front end to getting all those little pieces of software that you need as a dev. Right. And really it's the open source ecosystem. So saying it's an app store for developers is kind of the way I managed to pitch it to the investors, right, to get them to put money in. Like that makes <laughs> sense to them. But the truth yeah. is, is, it's kind of just like an independent app store built on top of the fruits of open source. And there's so much awesome utility in there. I'm curious, what are you seeing from like a macro level in Web3? What are most people focused on? I shouldn't say people. What are builders? What are developers focused on? Are there any trends that you're seeing? What I really like about like now, now that the last bull cycle sort of died and we're back in the bear cycle again, is that it's back to the people who just care about the tech. I just met people that were building cool solutions on top of Web3 tech who believed in it as a future who would work in it if there wasn't any money in it. They would just be working in it because they're excited about it. And that really reminded me of how it was like when I got into dev in the first place, like got into it by open source and then 
first company I worked at, you know, no one thought there was any money in that stuff. We were trying to build something cool and hoping that, you know, the company would figure out a revenue model at some point so we could continue to exist. That was the vibe I got. People were more interested in the utility of what we're building again. Is there anything that people are not focused on building or developers are not putting attention to that you wish they were putting attention to? Yeah, I, th I wish there was a bit more emphasis on some decentralization technologies. Too many of them are obsessed with blockchain, and I get it. You know, blockchain is awesomely cool, but it's not the only solution for decentralization, and we need more varieties of that stuff. And I've been actively looking through the open source ecosystem to try and find these things so I can like spotlight them, highlight them, maybe mm -hmm. even build some stuff on top of them. Like right. AI is incredibly popular right now, and what upsets me about what's going to happen with AI is how centralized it is. Because mm -hmm. uh, you need billions to possibly even billions of dollars to afford to build that model, to train right. that model. So in a way, that's possibly good because we're all worried about AI risk. But at the same time, it, it makes it a less interesting thing to participate in for all open source type people, all developers who want to be on the cutting edge. Like Web3 is way more exciting because... There's community there. There's a bunch of community in AI. It's just a bunch of people using the OpenAI API and then mm. re-implementing various different kinds of chatbots, mostly at the moment. It's, it's amazing how many open source projects I've seen that have come out have been like, you can have chat GPT in your terminal or whatever. Yeah, like, it's yeah. very light lap wrapper around the OpenAI API, right? It starts with the AIs on your computer. Right. Um, and so like Stable Diffusion managed to make a model that fits on your computer and anyone can use, but they needed millions of dollars of VC to do that, right? Because you still got to train the thing. So we really need a decentralized model builder, much like SETI was, you remember that? And like folding at home. Like these, no, these what we said it is. Yeah, these were screens. SETI was the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, I believe. I think the company that at least it was called SETI, perhaps, I don't know. But it was a screensaver, and it crunched all the data they had. Because what they had was too much data and not enough computation. So mm. you could download the screensaver, and then when your computer wasn't doing anything, it would be used for computation to try and find aliens. And, well, <laughs> sadly, I don't think that they ever really got much out of it. But it was a great idea, right? It's a great idea. And people weren't using their computers anyway. Yeah. And folding at home was the same, but for figuring out folds of proteins so i did do a bit of biochemistry so i should be able to express it better than that but yeah it's a complicated problem that google recently claims they completely solved with ai but you know this was years ago and so it was the same you were doing something good with your spare cpu cycles oh well, yeah using a bit more electricity than it would be otherwise but people felt good about it so we need something equivalent for building these models otherwise we're leaving it up to these companies to have the, all the power and all the control there. Where are the decentralization and technologies appropriate for that use case? I wish the, the Web3 community was more passionate about that. They are, but they're mostly passionate about the blockchain. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah. So you make a token and you can do a lot with that. That's right. token. Yeah. It's interesting to consider because before we hit record, you and I were talking about this spectrum from centralization to decentralization. As you said, in the case of AI, you need centralization in the beginning because you need so much funding and you need so much money. And so it's very difficult for a decentralized project to raise that level of capital and then also go execute and spend that capital and distribute it in the right ways and agree on it. And so, you know, in, in your case, your goal is decentralization for T, but you started centralized with VC backed funding because you knew mm. that was a faster way to get to your objective a fast, you know, so I don't know if that brings up anything for you, but it's an interesting conversation. Well, you know, like I've realized since we raised the money that maybe we could have just gone with a token sale right well it's mm. difficult I, li I live in america i'm an american citizen but obviously british originally and like it's shady nowadays which is unfortunate yeah. but i understand why the u.s has their reasons so maybe not and i i we were talking to carl samani at one point because multicolor were sniffing around and uh he was like you should just do a token sale <laughs> that was his his take so maybe you know maybe we could have the truth is like, i didn't know enough about it and if you get there's more to VC funding than the money. Like, I've got so much great advice from my investors. Mm -hmm. They really care about what we're doing. 
and they've mm-hmm. introduced us to like some amazing people as a result. So yeah, the truth is like maybe we could have done it without it, but it's been faster because we started with this centralized money and well, also like the package manager is kind of centralized right now. In terms of development, it's way faster to start centralized. And then when you figured it out, then decentralize. If you start off decentralized, I think you're asking for it to be a, a slog that mm-hmm. you might not get through. Dev is tricky. Uh, you've got to do it fast, but not too fast. And mm-hmm. you've also got to make sure that you're not slowed down by certain technical decisions too much. Yeah, well, and I've spoken to several leaders of DAOs who over the past year, partly as a result of us moving from a bull market to a bear market and them you know, not having the same level of funding and their tokens dropping, they had to shrink the size of their teams. And as a result, they became more centralized. But also, a lot of them talked about how they sort of needed to become more centralized. Index Coop went through this, Bankless DAO went through this, Klima DAO went through this, where there was a real struggle and a real challenge to the speed of execution that you can have with a smaller team versus a bigger team. There isn't this roadmap or this playbook yet for how do you build in a decentralized way and continue to build. And so what has happened is a lot have gone back to centralize, get small, get lean, make quick decisions, and then move back towards decentralization. Yeah. Well, we want to believe that it can be completely decentralized, but then when it goes wrong, like who's going to... Yeah. Open source in a way is like the original kind of DAO and uh, yeah. something I keep saying. I dominated homebrew's development for the first two to three years with an iron fist. And that was essential to make sure mm-hmm. that it was set on the path that it then was hugely successful for years mm-hmm. without mm-hmm. me being nearly as active. Uh, I was part of another DAO and like it had like issues that just couldn't be solved because of the way that the governments were set up initially and then right. there was no like get out of jail card for it. Right. It was, it was just right. screwed. So yeah, yeah. We're, we're definitely still learning how to do these yes. things. And I'm going to be super careful with how we set up the TDAO because for me, this is something that just cannot go wrong. Yeah. If T fails, then we're letting down all these people that need me to succeed so that they can earn a living from their open source. Yeah. Okay, I want to go back to, you mentioned AI, and I know you gave a TED Talk a couple years ago about how you learned to stop worrying and how to love AI. (laughs) Do you love AI? Are you worried about AI? How's it feeling? um, My my talk was deliberately positive because I wanted everyone to go away feeling like it was all right, but I didn't really feel that positive (laughs) having done (laughs) that search. Uh, so I did this talk uh, like five years ago or so, and uh, it's because, you know, when I was a kid, I, I believed AI would be with us like in no time and it would be amazing. <laughs> and then we all went through the AI drought where actually we discovered that intelligence is a lot more complex and difficult than we realized. And then suddenly we found out that actually all we need is fast enough computers and enough RAM. <laughs> and so while researching the the talk, yeah, I read all the material like super intelligence by Bo Strom and all the, uh, I've discovered Roko's Basilisk, which you should never look up if you haven't, do not look it up. And <laughs> all these other things, and I became like worried, certainly, you know, we won't be able to control it. Like the example I used in my talk was an AI applied to Wall Street and uh, it was tasked with accumulating as much money as possible. So it then accumulates like all the money. And then, uh, you know, obviously the global economy would collapse because no one entity can have the wealth and i thought that was you know a fairly good example because like it's not like terminator right it's it's not like uh, a science fiction movie where it hates us you know it's possible it'll hate us but it seems more likely it would just be unaligned in some like mm. trivial way <laughs> mm. and then it's not human so we can't figure out how to stop it but i've become more confident honestly over the years because i saw that the people doing the ai research are targeting these things so heavily towards humanistic pursuit and incorporating human data to such a huge extent. Like chat GPT is built on all of human knowledge from got from the internet. So it just can't not be human really in the way he behaves. That's all it knows. I've become more confident that whatever happens, you know, who knows how quickly this is going to happen. I follow a bunch of people on Twitter who think it's going to be tomorrow. 
and a bunch of people think it's going to be 20 years. I asked my friend who used to work at DeepMind what he thought. I asked him four years ago when I did my talk. And he said, oh, Max, we're nowhere near anything like that. Like, we don't even understand how we could get there. And then I asked him, like, a few weeks back, a month after ChatGPT was released. He was like, six years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think, I mean, in, in OpenAI's case, it's built on top of all of human knowledge. So how could it not be human at its core? But also, you know, I think I'm excited about the the potential of what AI allows us to do in terms of becoming more productive, becoming mm -hmm. more in tune with ourselves because you have something that is so intelligent that you can directly have a conversation with and you can learn from. Yeah, it's, it's really and cool, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's incredible. I hope all of our listeners out there are playing around with it because... Well, uh, I hope so as well, because let's face it, if you're not ahead of this curve, then you've got a good chance of being replaced by it. Yes. Like just this morning, I sent my designer the link to the product that is a plugin for Figma that you just type in what you want and it draws it for you in Figma. And I was like, I'm not sending this to you because I'm going to replace you. I'm sending this yes. to you so you can stay ahead of this. <laughs> right. Yeah. I want him to be one of the 3% of people that was there so early that they still are, you know, fine going mm -hmm. forwards. And that, mm -hmm. so we're taking advantage of that, right? Mm -hmm. I use Chat GPT and Copilot, Google Co GitHub Copilot uh, to write a lot of code now. You know, anyone who's not risks falling behind. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. Mm -hmm. It's not that you will be fully replaced. It's that you can learn how to make it a part of what you do mm -hmm. if you use it now. Because if you use it now, you actually become more valuable. You become faster. You can do things much quicker and you'll stay ahead of the curve. I mean, we've been talking about it on our team as well, you know, how we can use it in helping with our content creation, whether it be for the podcast, whether it be for our newsletter. And in any way we use it, we're not asking the AI to do something and then going and publishing that right away. There is still a human involved, but we are becoming better at what we do because we use it right mm -hmm. and it's not just efficiency and speed it's also just you know it's a smarter more knowledgeable person involved right they have all of the they have access to all the knowledge on the internet i don't have access to that at the tip of my mm -hmm. you know that can't i don't know all that stuff <laughs> it does have all of it i believe that we all will be replaced eventually in the meantime if you want a career then definitely stay on top of it i think there might be a lull in how it i hope so anyway because you know it's going too fast yeah like it would suck if like every all our dreams were just like suddenly irrelevant that, that, <laughs> that would suck i, would... I thought we were gonna get the positive angle here max <laughs> no, uh, positive in, i don't think it'll destroy us maybe not positive in terms of like how much of our jobs it's going to replace like, i love the way that it's coming after programmers first you know because Three years ago, I remember having a tweet discussion about this, and people were like, it will replace like the mundane jobs first, you know, like yeah. stuff that's easy. I was like, nah, it'll be programmers first. And my rationale was, as programmers, we're always trying to replace ourselves. As soon as we write something and it becomes tedious, we write a script to automate it away. So the people writing the AI, was my rationale, would want the AI to write itself mm -hmm. so that, you know, they'd could get there faster and do things faster so obviously it was going to replace programmers first and here we are yeah kind of this <laughs> although i guess it's kind of replaced certain kinds of art first artists yeah and, you know there's danny postma who released that modeling agency that the other day where you, you upload your headshots and it can create uh either a view or of your products with you know ai generated models holding them unexpected for a lot of people how it's emerging mm -hmm. certainly i never predicted that the way we'd initially be using it was more like a replacement for google how bizarre that i didn't think of that really with hindsight like it's such a, it seems such so a, obvious yeah. yeah but none of us did which is why it's still scary right because yeah i don't know anyone who predicted how ai would emerge and what use cases it would have that's certainly not generating images as one of like the no. major things that exploded into the mainstream with we all thought that was vastly more complicated than yeah chat gpt for example yeah completely uh, yeah. 
is exciting and maybe a little bit scary all at the same time. Max, this has been a great conversation. Uh, before we wrap up today, I just want to give you a chance to tell people where they can find you online, where they can learn more about TXYZ and anything else that you might want to show. Uh, yeah, so T.XYZ is our address. We got a package manager out. It's better than brew because I made brew and I knew how to make something that was better. It's actually really magical and lovely. And everyone who uses it is like, wow. And that's that's the thing I always go for with the products I make. I want the people using it to go, wow. I want it to like be so much better than what they thought it could be. So it's really good. Go and check it out. And uh, you can sign up for our mailing list so you know when the protocol comes out and when the GUI comes out. And, you know, like participate with us. Like we've got all these packages to make and there will be token rewards for people who submit packages as well as obviously token rewards if you just do open source in general. Mm -hmm. Like if you're an open source developer, like please come and check out our stuff, join up, sign up, and like start spreading the word about what we're doing because that's how it's going to make it so that you can get a paid a good salary for the important work that you do. I love it. I love it. Well, Max, thanks so much for joining the show today. It was a pleasure to have you, and we'll look forward to uh, following T and see you guys launch later this year. Great. Well, thanks very much. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. And if it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.